Hey gang, back at it here, resetting the neck on the 1951 SJ. For those unfamiliar, what I'm doing is I'm pulling this strip of sandpaper through the joint between the neck and the body. At the top end of the joint here, there's virtually no material being removed because the sandpaper immediately, you know, moves on. But at the base of the heel, down at this end, the entire length of the sandpaper touches it as it gets drawn through. So much more wood is removed on this side. And well, this effectively tips the heel back relative to the body. And if you think of the line of the frets as a teeter-totter, which balances right at the body joint here, we're pulling this side down and elevating the other side up. Now that other side intersects with the front of the bridge, so we'll end up with a taller saddle and a lower action. I can check the progress with a straight edge on top of the frets. And I want it to come to rest just above the surface of the bridge, like half a millimeter, about a sixty-fourth of an inch. With that, I should end up with a saddle exposure of about three thirty-seconds of an inch, maybe like 2.5 millimeters. I'm not the first person who's tried to reset on this guitar. Uh, there is evidence in various places. It's kind of a delicate thing. There's a, a balance between going too far and ending up with too tall a saddle and sort of maybe being a little bit timid and not taking enough off. So, If this was reset 25 years ago, they could have taken a bit more off, I think. But it's nice that they were erring on the side of caution. On a wide Gibson heel like this, um, pulling from the sides, there's usually a, an area in the center of the heel which has not been touched by the sandpaper. And at a certain point, you got to come back and remove that center portion because it will hold off the, uh, the rest of the heel from touching. It's only removing material in the center. I try to pull straight out. I don't really want to pull down or pull up because that can cause eccentricities to happen, you know, um, either rounding over the, the far end of the heel or causing a gap in the center of the heel. So. You can see that the heel is fairly loose in the pocket right now, and that's the consequence of having uh, a fairly large shim in it when uh, I removed it. So you have to sort of be careful that you keep it centered. It's also possible, if you're not careful, to actually tip the heel in its pocket, um, which can significantly change the line of the strings. So that's the other thing. You have to check every once in a while that you're not getting too far off course. I keep that to a minimum by pulling one side then the other and trying to keep the pressure similar. Before I go ahead and replace the neck on here, I think I want to do a little bit of touch up work to the missing lacquer on either side of the fingerboard extension, which I think was probably incurred during a previous attempt at removing it or loosening it up. Uh, especially here on the treble side, because it's a place that your pick could never hit it. You know, even if you were trying hard, you wouldn't be able to do this. And it just sort of sticks out like a sore thumb, even on a guitar that's got so much other wear on it. So I'll go ahead and mix up some color. This is a whole bunch of different browns. Van Dyke, raw sienna, burnt umber. It's uh, a complex kind of brown, and it varies from guitar to guitar. It's a fairly dilute mixture. And I build up the color. I spray pretty dry as well. I don't want big globs of it. 
and I'll also do the end of the heel which has uh, evidence of being uh, pushed off with uh, a screw clamp of some kind in the previous removal. After that I'll give it a shot of clear lacquer. Okay, I need to deal with the heel on the J45. You'll recall in the last video how terribly difficult it was to remove this. And it seemed to have been caused by two things. Number one, the dovetail and its pocket were not a good fit together. And a, a large soft poplar shim was used. Now that is the effect of poplar's great at compressing and then swelling up to fill any gaps between the parts. But if, say, the top of the pocket is fit a little tighter than the bottom and you put the poplar in there it'll swell to take up the extra room at the bottom. And it can create something like, you know the old um, paper Chinese finger traps? You can insert something into it, but it won't pull back out. It acts like a key. It blocks the, the travel of the neck. I think someone tried to remove this neck before, ran into that issue, gave up, and then shoved a bunch of glue between the sides and the heel and clamped it back together as best they could. And that compounds the problem because there's a whole lot more surface area that's glued and, um, well, it's in a pocket that won't allow the neck to come out. So, in efforts to get it off with the heel immobilized like that, it actually compressed and bent a bit from the force while it was hot and steamy. I don't know if you can see it, but the end is actually bent upwards slightly. It's bowed like this. And, you know, I'd like to straighten it back out, if possible, before I do the sandpaper pulls and fit this in. You'll recall that the inside of the heel surface is all end grain, so it's very absorbent. I need to paint it with some hot water. I'll boil some water, put it on there. Then I'm going to clamp it flat. And to do this, I made a little block that's got a cutout to accept the dovetail. And I'm going to use surgical tubing to wrap it up and do the clamping because it's pliable, which is nice in this case where you've got a curve, and it's very strong stuff if you use a bunch of wraps. And that should press that bit of warp out. I put an F clamp on there as well just to hold the tubing in place. I've glued a couple of pieces of mahogany to the sides of the SJ dovetail to make it wider. And next comes a long procedure of filing, sanding, and fitting it to the pocket with lots of testing and retesting. I want it to be perfectly snug when it bottoms out. You should be able to pick it up without it moving at all. I glued the neck onto the SJ here. In this case, I just did the dovetail. The extension part is still loose. And I did that because I wasn't sure if I would need a wedge under it. Kind of suspected I would, this being its second reset and all. But you never know about these things, especially on the ones with radius tops, because there's a rise already built into them. On Martins with flat tops in the upper bout, it's, you know, much easier to know ahead of time. In this case, I think it could do with a wedge tapering from about 30 thousandths, like around 0.75 millimeters, down to somewhere around nothing. Um, this is to reduce the amount of fall away or downward slope at the end of the fingerboard over the extension mostly for visuals, but also for ease of playing above the body. Let's talk about this fingerboard. Uh, these are not the original frets. They were replaced with something slightly wider. These are about 90 thousandths wide versus about 80 on the originals. That's fine with me. It's probably what I would do if it was my guitar. During the refret though, it looks like someone decided to sand the fingerboard, either to straighten it out or to try and get rid of some excessive divots in the rosewood. They got most of the way there except for a few spots in the lower positions. The thing is though, if you take your 12 inch radius sanding block and just go to town, it doesn't take long to burn through the binding and get into the side fingerboard dots. They start appearing from above. Looking at those divots going away, but that, you're not concentrating on what's happening on the sides. To add to that, it looks like this neck was in a pretty severe state of back bow when the sanding began. If you look at how much material is left above that first fret dot marker versus higher up the board, it's pretty obvious. 
Also, just visually comparing, it looks like the thinnest area of the board is up here between fret 7 and 9. So it's thinner here than it is at the first fret. That could be because whomever was standing was doubling up on their strokes in the center of the board. Here's a specific point. If I take my sanding block, it's being sanded continuously. And if I just stop at the edge uh, of the nut on the body, those areas are getting virtually no sanding compared to what's going on in the center. It could also happen if the truss rod was set very snug at the beginning of the sanding process, making that back bow. So you'd have a hump in the center here that you'd have to sand down through before your straight edge would register straight from nut to body. Paying attention to the truss rod is very important before you begin sanding a fingerboard. If it's very tight and the neck is in that back bow, it's possible to render the truss rod useless because it's at the end of its travel. You know, if the board is straight and then pulls up under string tension, there's no more room to turn it. So it's best to back it off slightly when you do this straightening process. The edges on this board have been heavily rounded over, too. Now that could happen through fret dressing, if someone was just using the file, got a bit vigorous. Uh, but it definitely makes it more difficult to install frets afterwards, because the ends will be unsupported and the line of the edge of the binding becomes slightly irregular. You know, this shouldn't be a problem on a board that has been dressed with the radius beam. Um, it should have a nice continuous arc that ends in a sharp corner. In this case we've got loose fret ends around the board in various places and the frets themselves they're sharp. Uh, they don't continue out to the edges of the binding of course because that edge is gone. But this also means that they're not quite as wide as they could be in this direction. Which, you know, on a 50s neck, that's not a huge problem, but on one of those super skinny mid-60s jobs, you want every bit of fret playing surface that you can get. You know, you don't want to have to cut a new nut and crowd the strings together any more than they already are to accommodate that narrowing. So, you know, just things to look out for if you're getting into this kind of work. I'll pull out the saddle and discover that it is coated in some brown doo-doo. A lot of it. And it's in the slot as well, hiding a poor fit. Yeah, yeah, it's a filler. It was necessary because this is a 3mm wide Graftec saddle in a much wider slot. This goo is wax, of course. So, even if I wanted to go back and plug the damage, um, this stuff acts to resist that. This slot looks very wavy, as if someone tried to cut it with a Dremel tool. And, you know, it's also very wide. I'm guessing probably 140 thousandths. Ooh, closer to 150. Oh. Almost 160 thousandths or 4 millimeters. So, yeah, I'm gonna have to plug it. Clean it out as best I can. I'll just route it, put a piece in, and then and then route a new slot. And sometimes it's a question of where do you stop with these things. But then, you know, other decisions are no-brainers. Like, what are you gonna do? Reset the neck and then leave something like this alone and have a really sloppy saddle fit? No, you can't. It's just like, it wouldn't be worth doing, you know? So, this thing is so wide, I can't get it with a 3 inch bit. I have to go for the full quarter inch, six millimeters, or like twice the size of a standard Gibson saddle. So I plowed a nice straight groove, and took some time to fit an appropriately colored piece of rosewood into its pocket. I'll glue that in place. All these little glue ups take, you know, several hours for the glue to cure, of course. Back to the J45 neck. Before gluing the fingerboard back together, I have to make a shim the same width as the saw if I used to separate it. With a hand plane, I can get it down to about 25 thousandths, just over half a millimeter. I'll take it the rest of the way with my little veneer scraper here. What's nice about this is that it's so finely calibrated that I can take off less than a thousandth of an inch with each pass and get something of very even width. I'll fill the space under the 15th fret, 
and then I'll glue a strip to the end of the fingerboard. I'll press that in place here with the ruler while it's drying. Then I'll use a combination of super glue on the shim and fish glue on the neck itself to hold it accurately in position while I get the clamps on. The clamping call has strips of cork along each of its outside edges. The saddle plug in the SJ is dried enough that I can now plane it down and sand it. And I think that's a, a reasonable looking plug. You're not going to notice that too much. The nut in this guitar was not snug against the fingerboard because it was being held away with remnants of glue. That could cause tuning issues, so I'll whisk those away. The nut itself was another Graph Tech product which I decided to continue to use because it was in like new condition. Here I'm plotting the line of the saddle using figures from an online fretting calculator. Half a millimeter tolerance is plenty because I'll find the proper points in the saddle itself during the setup. I'll position my router and use an eighth inch bit to cut the slot. Using my caliper, I'll take an accurate measurement of the length and transfer that to the bone blank. I want the saddle to fit snug enough to be able to lift the guitar, but still be removable with bare hands. I'll reinstall the fret I took out of the guitar when I was removing the neck. Earlier I glued up a couple of uh, back braces on this guitar as well. Virtually all of these 1950s Gibsons, it seems, have at least one or two back braces which have come loose. and. Um, they were in clamps for about five hours, but I want to let them go overnight and really get dry before I try and string this up. So I thought this was a good time to put on the pick guard. I'm just trying to get the positioning here. Choice of adhesive. On some of them I've used tight bond and that works okay. In this case we've got a really rough undulating surface. I'm thinking about contact adhesive again. I think it's it just makes more sense to me. But positioning it becomes a bit of an issue because, again, with the contact adhesive, I don't want to put any on the soundboard in an area where it isn't going to be covered because it's so hard to get off and it can just, it can do weird things to the finish. It'll, it won't dissolve it like lacquer thinner, but it'll, um, it burns into it and it pits it in strange ways. So I'm going to have to come up with some kind of cardboard, uh, masking thing again. I don't want to cover this whole body with tape for obvious reasons because like this is a really delicate finish. I coated both surfaces with adhesive, let them dry, and then using a point on the rosette to mark my place as if pulling a Yukioi woodblock print, I'll press them firmly together with hands at first and then move on to clamps and calls. Okay, the brand spanking newness of the pick guard against the shall we call it, elegant decrepitude of the rest of the finish here. Might be a bit much. So I've got some number one polishing compound. So it's a fairly aggressive polish on a paper towel rather than a, a soft cloth. I'm just going to go to town here. Something I should mention, this guitar is probably a good demonstrator of this. When you want to polish something that's really old and it's got fragile finish. Sometimes it's okay if it's got checks that are really close together and tight, but on a surface like this where you're missing fairly large chunks of finish, if you use a fine polishing compound on this, this is what happens. You know, it looks kind of clear when you're doing it, but then it dries to this chalky effect that there's really no way to get that out of there short of, you know, getting in with a knife and sort of picking it out which you're going to do more harm than good at certain points. So just be aware. Sometimes, you know, a high gloss is not what these guitars are meant to have at this stage of their lifetime. It's probably better just to use like a benign solvent, like um, I use naphtha, lighter fluid, to clean them. Um, or sometimes just a dry, soft cloth. Just rub it, you know. Speaking of rubbing, it's time to polishing, polishing, polishing. Using my tuner and the 12th fret octave, I'll mark out the intonation points for each string and then file the saddle to shape. Yeah, it bugged me enough to want to do something, so I've got the alcohol-based permanent markers. I like the Windsor & Newton and the Prismacolor brands. I'll tint away the white marks, just put some on and 
While it's still wet, rub it in and caress the surface with my strong yet sensitive fingers. No, this is not a formal, professional touch-up. This is just doing what I can. Okay, I think it's time to put this one to bed. It's been a long trip. Uh, mechanically, we can say that it's got action that's 35% lower than when it arrived. It's got a new saddle, which is much taller. And, um, you know, various cracks and loose braces have been glued up. It's got the new pick guard. And uh, it's probably ready to go for another 50 or 60 years. I think that's one thing that we should keep in mind when you're dealing with these older guitars that are 70, 80 years old, is um, they have an accumulated history that you're not going to get away from. They're never going to sound brand new for good and for bad. Um, there's accumulation of wear and damage and uh, subsequent repairs of that damage, and um, that all goes into the sound in one way or the other. So they start off as unique individuals and they get even more unique as time goes on. Not quite happy with this. It sounds great, it's very loud, and it sounds like a Gibson. So let's put it to the test. <laughs> 